Fantastic. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Dusty Stanford, uh, Global Account Executive over at Biopta. Uh, I want to thank you for attending today. Um, we've got some fantastic uh, information to share with you today. Uh, as we all know, back about six months ago, the world as we knew changed. Um, how people work, when they work, where they work, it, it's all changed. And with that, uh, the real estate teams and the technology teams have taken the brunt of a lot of the things going on. Uh, when people started to head home because the offices were closed, the technology teams had to make sure that the right technologies were in place to keep business moving forward. The real estate teams, they kind of froze for a few minutes because our people coming into the office, they thought this would be short duration, but now as we look at it, a lot of companies are looking at their real estate and trying to decide, do we bring people back? If we bring them back, how do we reduce liabilities? How do we keep people safe with social distancing? Or do we set it up with smaller remote offices or set it up where you know, people sign up to come into the offices? And that means a lot of changes within the real estate market. So, the technology or the data that the real estate team needs can come from the technology. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. I've brought two industry experts with me today. First today, you're gonna to hear from James Waddell. James is the Executive Vice President of Cognitive and focuses uh, a focused firm on innovation for data-driven optimization and uh, for critical assessments of your CRE portfolio to policy, procedure, planning, and modification. To the development of CRE-led technologies systems, Jamin and his team will lead you through every phase of the optimization process, focused for helping clients move from activity-based work to experience-based work. James has been a visible subject matter expert in the industry, leading teams in Coronet uh, Hackathon, Stanford Rebuild, and most re recently, CRE Tech Hackathon. Uh, James is going to provide us insight into the industry and where it's headed. From there, you'll hear from Nick Week. Uh, Nick is the Senior Manager of Product Management at Viopta. In his time here at Viopta, he has played a critical role in launching the Collaboration Performance Management Suite of Solutions and is currently the head of our Workspace Insights product line to focus on helping organizations leverage data-driven insights for workspace planning, key to what we're talking about today, and improving employee experience. Prior to Viopta, Nick spent five years at LinkedIn, scaling the talent uh, solutions business uh, unit to be the leader in the talent acquisition software space. Nick holds a degree in economics and secondary degree in international relations from Stanford University. So I'm going to turn it over to these folks. We're going to start with James. Folks, as you listen to this, if you have questions, you see the chat box off to the right. Please feel free to enter those questions. After James talks, then we'll switch it over to Nick, and Nick will give you another perspective. Again, feel free to enter questions. We're leaving time at the end. For, you to, for us to ask those questions of our speakers, our panel, and get you the responses you're looking for. So without further ado, I'm turning it over to James. James? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, somewhat dangerous. You're giving me an open mic and a, and a platform to speak, so I'm just going <laughs> to go to town. Hey, uh, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I just want to set a, a very brief uh, framework, common framework, uh, for this call. We have IT and some facility and corporate real estate on the call. I want to make sure that we're all looking at the same, um, uh, the same, using the same language and coming from the same place. Uh, so I want to show you a few pictures. This is a picture of Hearst Tower uh, in New York. It was around 800,000 square feet. This is a picture of Googleplex um, out in California. It was around 3 million square feet. Uh, this was Facebook out in Menlo Park, uh, roughly 400,000 square feet. And right now you're probably thinking of some iconic buildings where you live. You might be thinking of what used to be called the Sears Tower, maybe the Chrysler Building, maybe the Apple Complex. But the common theme here is, is that these buildings, these offices are the physical embodiment of the corporations um, 
that that they hold. And I, I think for that reason, if for no other reason alone, the corporate office is still going to be here uh, in our current situation in a post-COVID world and as for as far as we can see. There's a, a um, an embodiment, a need, if you will, to have a physical manifestation of our corporations in the world that we're in. Now, what's happening in the space is probably going to change. So let's take a look at that, right? There's some trends that we always knew about, and they're very loosely listed here. But when we were building office spaces and corporate campuses for the last 10, 15, 20 years or so, we, we included many of the things that you see in this framework. So we always looked at it from people, space, and technology, what needed to happen in that. And then our strategies included things like scalability or satisfaction of the occupants or maybe worker well-being. And really depending upon the culture of the corporation is really decided where we put those in brands, uh, where we put those investments um, in the building and design of that workplace. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning was something that was starting to come along. Uh, Internet of Things from a technology perspective also was starting to come along. But what's happened in a post-COVID world? COVID has accelerated numerous trends uh, that again, we knew were coming. Uh, work from home has always been a trend. Uh, even from a policy perspective that, that corporations were thinking about from a policy perspective about how much they should be working from home. I think the global experiment has proven to be true based on the data that we have seen. Certainly work from home is, is very effective. People feel very well supported. Uh, they feel the technology is supporting them in their ability to do the work that they want to be able to do. They feel very connected and, and from a collaboration perspective. However, and I think this is common knowledge throughout the industry now, people feel there's a, a lack of a social connection in the in, in a work from home environment. So I think that's top of mind for everyone. If we were to come back to the office, how do we re-engage from a social connection perspective? Uh, I wanna take it one step deeper than that when we look at what's happening from a trends perspective. There's two key trends that are tr taking place at the moment that our data is showing us. There's this, what's the office for? So purpose of the office and autonomous workplace. Let's dive into purpose of the office just for a second. Our offices post-industrial revolution have been places where knowledge workers come to produce the work that they produce. And ultimately it's become process oriented. Uh, so you can think of accounting or something along those lines. We came to the office to move through our processes, move through our day, and then we went home. Uh, and that's ultimately the very generic definition of pre-COVID offices. Post-COVID offices are going to be something entirely different. Uh, I think they're going to be built from an experience perspective. They're going to help build a sense of community and social interaction. They're going to help us as humans uh, engage in problem solving. And absolutely, it's going to change and help drive innovation. On the other side of this, from a trends perspective, is autonomous workplace. And for now, let's just say that that's an ecosystem of solutions that allows us uh, to have streamlined functionality in the place, in, in our workplace and allows the occupants to have much more responsive control. And in fact, uh, over a few years and a few iterations, the workplace will become uh, uh, self-autonomous. And I'm gonna show you why that is uh, as we move through this presentation. But let's take a look at activity-based and experience-based work. Uh, I mentioned a little earlier, activity-based work is very task-based, it's very office-based. People typically move between the office space that's required for the task. Now, typically what we've done when we've, when we've modeled uh, space in the past is we've had heads down space, we have collaboration space, we have open collaboration space, we have closed collaboration space. And it was the intent that the occupants would move into those particular spaces that was needed for the work that they wanted to do. Uh, and that worked well. Uh, however, uh, what we see today is something that's more experience-based. People will be going to the office to achieve an experience that's not available anywhere else. Uh, so what does that mean? That means really you can work from anywhere that you feel more productive. You'll be going to the office because the office has a space that you can curate in order to meet the requirement experience at that time. It could be a group uh, uh, brainstorming session to drive innovation. Of course, the next session after that would be collaboration to figure out what your deliverables or your processes is going to be. Point is people can choose to be in the office only for the duration of the experience that they want. Um, a little bit of soapbox message here. I think what's going to drive the economy moving forward is a very heavy focus on innovation, being able to move from the processes that we've had in the past 
and maybe learning how to automate those processes uh, through maybe robotic process automation and freeing up our human experience in order to be able to really focus on um, innovating and moving the human experience forward. There's never been a greater time uh, in this post-COVID world for us to come together as corporations to figure out how to do things in a very innovative fashion. And I think that's what's gonna drive our economy moving forward. And ultimately one of the reasons that's driving this new type of workplace. If we look at uh, how new is this trend, uh, and I've said all these trends that for the most part that we're talking about and that we know about have been around for quite some time. I can go back to Noel who published an amazing report. They started doing research in 2012. They published in 2016. I'm gonna cite some of the information from that report here. And also related to that was a Hayworth report that was published in 2016. Both of these companies, granted context was different, but both of these companies predicted our need for an experience-based workplace today. And they've given us some insight on what that might look like. One of the things that Noel so, saw in their report was this change from a very militaristic hierarchical structure of getting work done, this linear flow of getting work done, to this more complex um, ad hoc structure, where maybe you're bringing in subject matter expertise on an as needed basis. And I certainly see that as one of the trends as well, sort of the subtrend, in that maybe hiring full time uh, as a trend is gonna move less and less. And what we're gonna see is more and more knowledge workers being brought on on a project specific basis or for an, a defined period of, of collaboration and innovation necessary for the company. And then they'll be free to move on to the next uh, the next company. So contract work is certainly something that's going to be moving forward. Again, has a huge impact on our on our workplace and what that might look like. Certainly has uh, an interesting impact on access control, and the types of technology you might have for both physical access as well as uh, data access within your space. When we look at the space in general, and this is a graphic from uh, 2016, so you can imagine there's there's a few little tweaks uh, that need to be made to make this uh, post-COVID um, a reality. But they they were so amazingly on point is why I wanted to show this way back in 2016. Uh, and side note, I have no relationship with Noel, no business relationship with Noel. This is purely um, uh, an amazement on my part from the fact that they got it right so many years ago. Now you'll see here that there's very few spaces for focus work, for heads down focus work, because that's the very definition of activity-based work and that's what we're moving away from. One of the key things that you'll see here is space that's very easily reconfigurable for the work that needs to be done. We're still gonna be in closed spaces for enclosed collaboration because we have an innate need for privacy. Maybe it's something you don't want the general workplace to know about, so you need to have an enclosed space for that. Um, but we also see here areas of refuge. That is gonna be absolutely key, I believe, um, moving forward. And it's not a place that you go if there's a fire. Uh, it's a place that you go to relax. It's a place that's maybe biophilic designed in nature probably going to have some technology support related to it. But how many of those do you have and where do you have them and are they being used and are they being effective? All those questions can be asked of all the spaces. Um, are my enclosed meeting rooms being used? Or is the technology in those closed meeting rooms being used? Do I have the right mobile type of, of unified communication systems, maybe collaboration whiteboards for the spaces that are easily reconfigurable? That's all data driven. And, and we know data driven design has been around for a while. In fact, data driven design is what helped to inform our activity based workplace. How many or how much of a particular activity uh, space do I need? This is a little bit different. This is something that we call workplace experience. So it's the occupants and the, and the number of occupants and where those occupants are spatially and the type of technology those occupants are using in order to get work done. Are they using it or are they not using it? Are they using it because uh, it works well? Are they not using it because they don't know how to use it? Or are they using it because it's a technology that just doesn't support the work they're trying to get done? Again, that data, that insight of data is far beyond what we've typically seen in the past. We're moving far beyond just occupant uh, counting. And we really got to get deep into being able to look at the spaces and the technology that's being used in those spaces. One of the key trends that we all know about is bring your own device. Um, it's gonna be substantially increased even more now in an in, in, um, experience-based workplace. Um, when we think about some of the latest technology related to mobile computing, and there's, again, I'm not selling Microsoft Surface Duos, but that's an amazing device that potentially could replace your desktop or your laptop computer. Rather than carrying around a laptop or a tablet 
and a phone, you're now carrying around a compute device that's very easily and seamlessly able to project on screens in your, in your experience-based workplace as you need to. So these are things that you need to know are coming, uh, that you need to know today in order to effectively plan for a post-COVID workplace uh, in the near future. And you also need to be able to get that data uh, that's necessary uh, to know uh, what's working and what's not working. This is one I thought was, was very telling. This one came from the Hayworth Report. If you know a space is underutilized, then you can certainly reuse that space in a way that's able to drive a greater interaction of human beings uh, and potentially drive more collaboration and more innovation. This is a perfect example of maybe a 16-person conference room that's exclusively being used or very rarely being used, I should say, for 16-person uh, collaboration Maybe there's a 16-person conference room that's only being used for three or four or even two people uh, having a, attempting to have a private meeting. This type of data, it seems very rudimentary in that you have the ability to maybe just peek in to see if it's being used on a, on a, on a, uh, every afternoon or so to see how it's being used and just sort of record it. But when you look at this across the corporate real estate portfolio, maybe a three million square foot corporate real estate portfolio, and you realize that you only have a 30% room utilization, that is a significant spend and, and misalignment between the space and the people's needs. And that's what we're trying to drive out in these conversations related to experience-based work. Do we have the right space for the right type of work for the right type of people in those spaces uh, being done? With that, I wanna introduce you to this, this new concept. I think it's a new concept. There's a term called agile workplace. And it, for corporate real estate, agile means something different than from the technology perspective. So I wanna try to combine those two meanings. Uh, agile is uh, a manifesto that's used in programming on the technology side. Agile on the corporate real estate side typically meant you had uh, the ability to quickly change. It was, it was very nimble. So here's what we come up with. We come up with something called the, the WX, Workplace Experience Agile Manifesto. There's four components to that. The first one, individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Certainly your processes and tools are very important. What we're saying is from a focus perspective, from a design perspective, from a workplace strategy perspective, individuals and interactions should come before processes and tools. There was a time when we looked at the type of technology we wanted to deploy or the type of processes that we wanted to do in a particular business unit and then we backed that into the workplace strategy and subsequently that informed the workplace design. Uh, what I'm saying is our data has suggesting that is the backwards approach. The new approach is to put individuals and in interactions first. The second, working workplace experience over comprehensive documentation. What does this mean? This means we have to have the ability to start small and to fail fast. So we, we know that every corporate culture is gonna be slightly different. Every business unit's gonna be slightly different. There are known good uh, practices that we can deploy, known good technologies that we can deploy, but ultimately what we have to learn over time is which one of those is best for our corporate culture and for our business units, and then model that appropriately moving forward. So don't necessarily spend a lot of time focusing on the perfect plan with the perfect set of documents. Focus more on finding the path to optimization and making sure you're on the path to optimization. The third rule, occupant collaboration over policy negotiation. We don't, we shouldn't, our data suggests, whatever precursor you wanna put there, should not be in a situation where we're forcing our occupants to do stuff, um, whatever those things are. What we should be in from, a, from an experience-based workplace perspective is helping understand why the occupants want to come into the space working very openly and seamlessly with the occupants to ensure that that space, the technology in that space is being very effective for what they hope that space will do for them. Again, it's an experience that they can get in that space that would be very difficult to get anywhere else. Certainly not impossible, just difficult to get anywhere else. And that's key, uh, making sure that we're not trying to policy enforce our way back into something that we've done in the past because it feels good. We know what, they, what we've done in the past. And last, the fourth piece, responding to change over following a plan. We absolutely have to have a plan. We have to know where we're going. We have to know what our long-term strategy is. We have to know uh, if we're divesting, what our divestiture plan is for corporate real estate. All of that is true. However, 
because we're in this state of very rapid innovation and very rapid change, we should put responding to change before following a plan. The plans that we have, very important. Again, knowing the destination for our trip and where we're going is very important, but we have to be very, very flexible, agile, if you will, very agile in making sure that we're constantly readjusting and adapting for what optimize looks like in our regions for the business units, because all of that will change. The next that I wanna get into, the next big trend I wanna get into is autonomous workplace. Um, autonomous workplace is ultimately a workplace that is very data driven. You can think of it as being able to get data out of all of the systems that you've deployed, at least the best data that you can get out of those systems. So security systems, facility systems, lighting control, indoor air quality, uh, card readers, uh, ITAV systems, your phone systems, unified communication systems, being able to get all of that data out in order to inform the insights that are aligned to your workplace strategy. So first and foremost, that's autonomous workplace today. Where will that go moving forward? That data will help inform what technology can do to support health and well-being in that space. So is your areas of refuge being used? Are they working well? Maybe you have areas where you're doing uh, circadian rhythm lighting with some biophilic design. Is that space being used? Now we can take that one step further as well. And this is sort of the automation part. Once we've gotten the data and it's, it's informing us with correct insights and we're making tweaks to our strategy and our implementations and we're heading down the road of optimization, I now have very good data to figure out if system A and system B were able to talk to each other through some form of intelligent automation it would take the burden off of my occupants in, in some way. It would make that space much easier to use and much people will be much more willing to come in and use that space. Now, I don't wanna berate this, but we all know it. it. In the office of yesterday, for me to come in and hook up my display in order to have a collaborative, collaborative experience in the office, it could sometimes be very difficult and it could change from room to room. It could change from site to site. And again, it wasn't necessarily the best and most friendly experience. When I think about working from home, uh, if, if you have some of the same equipment, like maybe you have a Samsung phone and a Samsung TV, it is seamless to be able to present uh, with yourself and your dogs uh, at home. But that experience, that consumer experience, that ease of use, and the ability for the system to start thinking about how they can help you is where we're headed from an autonomous workplace perspective. Again, the key to this is we have to have the data, the insights today, that data, that the insights that we can drive from that data move us towards uh, a fully optimized experience-based workplace. And then later, what we'll find is the ability to integrate those systems to make that workplace work better for us. There's a, another note out there, and it's about sensors and how sensors can help us uh, determine what's best from an occupant experience. Uh, and I agree with everything that you can read about sensors. There is, however, a path as a first step that will allow you to get a lot of the data that we just talked about from your systems to start your journey on an experience-based workplace where you don't have to install sensors. And that's one of the reasons I love working with Viopta. Uh, and with that, I'm going to let Nick tell you exactly what that's about. All right. Thanks, James. And to the folks on the call, I think this is what James put together and what Cognitive is doing is an incredible overview uh, on how real estate and UC or collaboration teams are really converging. And that's where Viopta has been coming from the other side of it, starting with the collaboration teams as that has evolved over into the last couple of years, uh, getting into the real estate aspect of that. So what I'm gonna walk through today is really first a background on Viopta and our vision in workspace. So covering both those elements and perspectives of real estate and uh, collaboration. I'm gonna introduce uh, secondarily a framework. So what we're seeing post COVID, what is the transition state and how are we going to address it? Uh, and then third, do a deep dive into a methodology. And that's how we produce data-driven solutions, um, whether it's Biopta or elsewhere, it can still be applicable uh, to how you quantify a lot of this change. So with that, I'm gonna share my screen, go into presentation mode. All right, perfect. So first, that background that we talked about on Biopta, 
Uh, so for over 10 years, Biopta has been laser focused on collaboration. Our vision is to improve both internal and external collaboration, and we've been focused on the technologies, so servicing the IT teams who support them, looking at you know, performance management solutions. But over the past four or five, really, we've broadened that to look at the workplaces, workspaces, uh, and the employees who are doing the collaborating. So our, our vision is to really focus on the outcome, the, the collaboration and what that is doing to accelerate uh, workplace transformation whether that's the technologies that are you know, supporting all of this, the spaces where it's happening, and then the employees who are obviously the integral part to it. So when you think of what Biopt is trying to do, uh, here, again, the both kind of uh, archetypes that are on the call of the folks supporting collaboration, whether it's you know, fully from a technology perspective or you know, the, the real estate folks who are really looking at square footage in the office, what happened with COVID really flipped the, the world upside down. And so we've introduced this new framework to uh, support how our vision can have a number of different use cases into it. We'll walk into that, that framework here in a sec. Uh, so the first, when you think of fully remote, you know, shelter in place and everyone home, uh, you know, God forbid that happens again where it's everyone, but if that is the case or if there are uh, segments of your population that are going to be strategically sent to work from home. You think of the problems around engagement, productivity, and performance management, and we have solutions that look at that type of adoption, uh, utilization, and systemic issue detection. All of this in one single pane, looking at the technologies that support fully remote usage uh, across different vendors, and it's purpose-built uh, for, for supporting that use case. This is really where we think that the industry is, certainly in, in America, and it's you know, different all over the world, but in some flavor, we're starting to get into re-entry. So everyone was sent home. All of a sudden now, we need to plan for safe re-entry. We need to think about policy reinforcement. Both of these are really tough to do without data. And so what we're bringing into the mix and we'll walk through in this methodology is what are the data points that you can bring to the table? whether you're in real estate or you're in collaboration to help a, a safe reentry process uh, and then to look at compliance after the fact. You know, everyone on this call could be tasked with you know, a safe reentry plan. Are people actually following it? Who are the, the worst offenders of breaking these rules? It's really critical questions that you need to answer while you're in this stage of reentry. Uh, and lastly, if we open up here and look at the long term future, uh, you know, Biopta is definitely in agreement with what James was talking about. This isn't the death of the office, it's a change. And the change is that there's going to be a mixed state. So folks will be uh, collaborating with people in the office, but there's always gonna be some element now of folks at home. And so how do you, from a collaboration side, look at interoperability uh, and make sure that it's a good experience with that mixed environment? And from a real estate side, how do you optimize the spaces now that, you know, there's a different mix of folks who are joining remote in, you know, or in person. How do you optimize all of that? And we have solutions for that single pain management. Uh, and then in particular, Workspace Insights, our product line is geared towards that use case of optimizing those spaces. So again, we are a collaboration company. That is what we've always focused on. It's what we will focus on. We're going to look at collaboration as it touches the technologies, the workspaces, and the people that are taking part into it. Uh, and today we're going to really focus on the office re-entry state of, of the world that we see today um, and how we can help out. And in terms of, of honing in that problem a bit more, when you think of why people are coming back to the office, uh, we got this from the, the folks at Gensler that did a, a pretty massive study around the top reasons people are returning to the office. And you'll see number one up here tied with a couple of other reasons. Scheduled meetings with colleagues. The reason why people are going back to the office is because it is hard to have the level of collaboration you know, remotely with workers or uh, coworkers, you know, with clients to get the job done. That's why they're coming back to the office. So our solution to help with reentry, transition, and, and even as you look at you know, the, the long-term state of things, is really looking at how can we bring data to that problem to help people meet safer, to help people meet more effectively. So <clears throat> here's the, the framework that if you leave you know, with anything from this call, I hope that it helps to put on paper, so to speak, something that a lot of folks have known to be true, 
but I don't see necessarily in, in this fashion. Uh, and this is something that whether you are on the real estate side and planning, you know, what does our footprint look like, uh, both in terms of you know, square footage and you know, the combination of room size and technology, or if you're on the uh, IT side, this is what we're starting to you know, really promote and push out there. Um, and that we're seeing leading organizations, when you can quantify this, you'll be much more effective in planning your spaces and technology as well as optimizing them. And we call this the, the kind of perception to you know, reality trade-off. When you think of all those spaces and again, why people are coming back is to schedule those meetings with colleagues, uh, to work collaborative, collaboratively uh, together. Your employees, you know, the C-suite, the management, their perception is booking. So what is scheduled in your, your system of record? And we're gonna slowly work our way over to the inefficient reality. First is those missed bookings. So these are you know, something that's reserved in the calendar, no one shows up. Uh, something else that is you know, plaguing calendars that we're seeing are excessive bookings. So I can show up, so I wouldn't show up here. If I book a meeting for five hours, show up for five minutes, that's four hours and 55 minutes of a perception that I can't use the room uh, when the reality is it was open. From there, you have your attended bookings, but even that starts to whittle away when you think of how effective it can be. So first case scenario, you can have a beautiful half a million dollar video immersive room, beautiful furniture in there, it's in your high rise building. Two people can reserve it, go in for a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Uh, similarly, you start to hear on the, the corporate side of the house, the corporate IT side of the house, that is, we don't have enough video, we don't have enough screens, we don't have X technology. You need to understand what people are doing in the rooms as well as how they're booking. Uh, this is one that kind of post-COVID, some folks are saying, hey, it's actually not too bad. But even in the post-COVID world, if you think of a 20-person room being used by two people, the perception is you know, when you book that room, uh, we don't have enough big spaces. When the reality is, you know, if those two people went in, let's say, a 10 or five person room, that could be meeting your COVID social distancing guidelines and it frees up more of that big space. Uh, and then the, the new entrant into the kind of inefficient reality is too high of occupancy. So a lot of organizations are doing what we call the quick fixes. So let's remove chairs, let's say, hey, your rooms can only be 50% full. But you need to understand, is that the case? Are people actually you know, getting into the office, feeling safe, and then cramming into these rooms? So the end state is the kind of optimal booking or usage is a small fraction of the perception. And so again, we're pushing this framework and methodology so that folks can start to use you know, quantifying these different steps uh, for both planning more effectively, new spaces or refreshes, and then optimizing what they already do have. So a, a couple of examples, we have clients who are using this methodology and by often workspace insights that can quantify all of these steps here for you. They're using it to go from 13 floors in a high rise back down to 11, saving $80 million over a five year lease period. To bring the data to that table, to go to the executives to say, this is your perception, but here's the reality, here's how we can improve it. Then you have a number of Biopta clients, you know, Bay Area tech companies that are really worried about productivity. For them, it's about how we get that perception and employee you know, happiness and effectiveness of collaborating you know, through the roof. They're not going to be planning new campuses all the time, but with what they have, how do they refine the employee experience? And they're using Biopta to get very actionable insights around who are the folks that are you know, booking and missing meetings, excessive meetings, uh, no or wrong tech being used, so they can go out and correct that behavior. So uh, one point to, to kind of hammer this home, it's difficult. The we Viopsa are a company that uh, lives and breathes data around this all of the time. Uh, and yet, you know, when COVID hit, it was, it's such a, a change in the world. Nobody at Viopta updated their calendars, and this was one uh, you know, you, even Viopta isn't immune to this reality. It's, there's so many inefficiencies between how you reserve spaces and how you actually use them. You can see here, all of our ad hoc you know, bookings that are non-recurring of all of our spaces you know, fell off a cliff once shelter in place hit here. Everybody left their recurring meetings on the calendar. And so again, if you go back here, 
I can guarantee you know, folks on the real estate side or on the IT side, whatever kind of background you have coming to this call, there is going to be a big perception difference from the reality of what is being used in your offices, especially as we're re-entering only certain folks. So by quantifying you know, what's booked versus what's actually used, we think we can drive a, a good amount of planning efficiencies and then optimizing your spaces that exist. So in terms of what we deliver and the, the methodology of how we do this, on the left-hand side of the house is our, our kind of core IT products. So CPM monitoring, which helps to proactively avert you know, collaboration technology issues, looking at call quality. CPM analytics is looking at these you know, systemic trends of, of collab performance. Workspace Insights is what we're gonna focus on today and the problems that that solves, especially in this re-entry use space. So if you think of Workspace Insights, there's really three pillars that we, we look to address. The first is visibility. The second is um, inefficient usage and behavior. So not necessarily planning a new office, but with what you have, how do you make it safer and how do you make it uh, more efficient for employees? And then the third is that big ROI use case. Whether you're on the real estate side of the house um, and wondering you know, about all those the high dollar you know, leases that you have or building purchases that you have, or if you're on the collab side and you're being tasked to inform the real estate side, how many spaces do we need? It's a huge component of how much real estate you have, and we can help with all three of these. So I'll, I'll walk through each one of these pillars here. Um, and again, this is meant to be sharing out our methodology, the metrics that we calculate um, that you can do on your own. Obviously, we'd love to do a demo for you on how Biopta can automate a lot of this for you. Uh, but the point being, these are the data points and the visibility that we think in this world in transition uh, you really need to have top of mind. Uh, so to, to start out, when you think of a lot of these conference room spaces, uh, if you don't know what's going on inside of them, you're in good company because a lot of folks don't. And so where Workspace Insights and our solution is different, we provide that first level of occupancy with the gear that you already have in the rooms. So there's a proliferation of sensor technologies out there, which is fantastic. Uh, but we think the fastest way to do this is to look at what you already have in the room. Uh, and additionally, with getting that occupancy, we can tell what people are doing in the room. And then we layer over scheduling and look at the overlap of all these. So we have a purpose-built data set for each of these three pillars, plus the value add that we go in there and kind of uh, layer up all these data sets and look at the intersection to get you some actionable data. So to start on the optimization side of the house. I'm gonna walk through a couple examples of problems that people face, a metric or methodology that we support in our solution that you can use, um, and then how that solves that problem. And the first kind of inefficiency that we, we love to tackle are people not showing up. So again, think of you know, your wave one or two of folks that are re-entering the office. They're gonna be competing and looking for you know, what's in the calendar. So let's make sure that what's in the calendar actively reflects what people are actually attending. So Biopta can go all the way down to the individual user, we call this our kind of worst offenders list, um, to highlight the people that are booking but not showing up, so you can ultimately free up more space. Additionally, the problem around booking that five hour meeting but showing up for five minutes, Biopta calculates what we call unused meeting minutes. So that's looking at all of the minutes that were booked versus what was actually used. That delta of the unused meeting minutes is really important to track over time because that can also free up more space for you. Um, is the meeting occupancy too low? So that's normally a problem of that 20 person room only having two people. The perception is we don't have enough big spaces. Now with COVID, you can also flip this on its head of is the occupancy too high? So we can have, and we go down again to the individual hosts or reserving those spaces and see how full the room is so you can optimize the, the size of the spaces. And then here, you know, we'd be happy to jump into our solution and our tool around what technologies are being used and the libraries that we've built to understand all the different API, make, model, firmware versions of these video conferencing units. What's going on in the room? Is it audio, video, presentation? So you can eliminate the wasteful tech bookings so that you can, you know, 
tackle some of those complaints around, hey, there's not enough video, there's not enough screen sharing rooms uh, to get to the right mix. Uh, and lastly, so James talked a lot about, all right, we need to be outcome focused and experience focused. There's a lot of workspace experience folks out there saying, how much of our room should be ad hoc versus you know, book a room? And once you make that decision, are people following those guidelines? So we can help you to promote that correct you know, share of ad hoc versus schedule by looking at what's actually taking place in and outside of the calendar usage. So again, all of this is gonna help that employee experience. Um, you know, in this case, especially with number three, flipping that on its head, keeping them safe in this re-entry, make sure that they have the right resources you've already invested in and are getting the most out. So on the, the flip side of that, a lot of the CRE folks who've joined the call are thinking, great, you know, but I'm thinking about a three, five, 10 year horizon. What can we do you know, with the data that Biopta collects to help plan more effectively? And the first is looking at occupancy. The problem of is the space used at all, it's ultimately going to you know, tell you how many spaces you, you need to build or refresh. This is where Biopta, by deploying our singular collection mechanism, we can help your IT team, and we've been doing that for years to help them look at call quality and disconnect reasons. The same collection we power around the clock usage uh, to calculate occupied room minutes. So we can tell is anybody in these spaces at all just from the, the gear that you already have in place. No more you know, occupancy studies, clip, clipboards, or you're know, deploying another set of sensors. Take advantage of what you already have and it's a deployment that your IT team will actually like because it benefits them as well. Uh, and we can help you to understand how often those rooms are being used. Additionally, with some of the newer technologies, we can go the next step and say how full the room is. So you can help plan out how big of a space you need. Pre-COVID, it was, hey, smaller rooms, everyone's going into huddle spaces. Well, now, do we really wanna make the rooms that much smaller? We're worried about social distancing. Bring data into the equation and you can plan more confidently. Uh, another big one is, is looking at planning the technology in the spaces. So really touching both the real estate side and our, our sweet spot of IT. I mentioned this before, but Biopta's built libraries across different make, model, firmware versions, across different vendors. Because we're helping IT to troubleshoot these rooms, we also built out these libraries to understand what people are doing. So is it audio, video, and you'll notice you know, presentation only is it the pink chunk of the, the donut here versus the green chunk, which is you know, that beautiful video room. If you're getting, in this case, you know, 50% of the time, roughly, people are just going in for in-person meetings. That's going to change how you plan looking forward. And we're really uniquely positioned to provide this type of data. Uh, and lastly, we talk about you know, the perception and then the inefficient reality. We bring into one place, whether you're using Google Calendar, Office 365, we have an open API that you can push other calendar data to this. We give you the perspective and a, a purpose-built tool to look at scheduling as well as the unused meeting minutes. And this is where in that planning exercise we, we reference our one client went from 13 floors uh, down to 11 floors for a big five-year lease. They went to their executive team and said, hey, you think you're using it this much? But here's that waste between what people are reserving and what they're actually using. So therefore, we're planning for two less floors, and they went into every detail around how often the rooms were occupied, how cold they were, what people were doing in the rooms. They had that data-driven case to go with less floors uh, because Biopta brought the data together. So again, whether you're looking at the optimization use case and really that re-entry use case of people, keeping people safe, uh, you're looking at the planning use case, and you're more on the real estate side or on the uh, IT side and planning out what's in the rooms. Uh, Biopta has a unique perspective because we take advantage of what's already in the spaces and have built that integration into calendaring systems and look at the logic in between them uh, to help both planning and optimization. So um, that's kind of our methodology and how uh, we're fitting that into the framework of the, the current state of the market of people you know, looking at re-entry. Uh, we've been doing this for a number of customers for quite a while now. A couple of them are up on the screen. We'd love to talk to you about what our solution can do, but in general, we want to promote this idea, uh, regardless of if you're using Biopta 
your collaboration teams, the IT teams, need to be working with the real estate teams. They're going to win if you look at the data that is coming, you know, really on both sides, whether it's occupancy or collaboration activities. Uh, so that's why we're excited to partner, partner with folks like James on the, the real estate side uh, to bring a lot of this data and methodology to the table. So with that, uh, we want to transition over to Q&A. So Dusty, I will... Uh, well, thank you for that. Uh, I guess, folks, uh, are there any questions for our panelists here today? James, you want... There you go. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, any questions that you have for us, uh, for the experts, uh, they're here to help and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I guess in light of questions, I guess one thing I'd like to ask is, James, you started with the picture of these big monolithic offices. Mm -hmm. um, with the change with COVID, uh, are you seeing a change in how businesses are planning their real estate? Are they are they moving to um, away from the big corporate office, but keeping it, but still looking for smaller remote locations? Or what are they doing um, to one protect the employees and make it easier for the employees? You know, it, it's interesting. There's a, some undercurrent there that's um, sometimes difficult to talk about. Rather than talk about where work gets done. Uh, sometimes the conversation is what work gets done. So there's this notion of uh, uh, robotic process automation and, and, and what our workers are doing today in order to drive uh, collaboration. Uh oh, I just saw my, my internet connections getting a little wonky, so you, I might drop, in which case you'll have to ask Nick to, to answer. Uh, but in any case, um, knowing that we want to have offices closer to where people live, um, that's a, a big prevalent uh, trend as well. So rather than asking everyone to come all the way downtown, which is typically or out to the campus environment, maybe we can have a space closer if you wanted to do some heads down focus work uh, outside of your home environment. So I think that that's certainly a trend that we see and that's top of mind and certainly it shows up in all the data that, that we're generating from our research. So the next Nick, thing is, oh, go, go ahead, ahead. Keep going, keep going, keep going. I'm no, I was, just, I was just going to finish that thought with the corporate real estate that we currently have downtown. I think it'll be repurposed. I think there's some large companies that might be looking at divesting some of that, but many of the conversations that we're having with, with corporate real estate, they intend to keep it and to simply repurpose it into this uh, new type of workplace that we talked about. And Nick, Nick, same question, I guess, more from the IT perspective. What are you hearing? Uh, in regards to the corporate facility, maybe to more rural facilities or closer to home? Yeah, so on the IT side and with kind of Biopta's heritage of really supporting IT folks with you know, hardware video endpoint monitoring, uh, there is a big shift and whether that's video endpoints going into offices in the suburbs um, for smaller spaces and having that you know, experience of you know, being in an office, having that connectivity, but still wanting to connect to folks remotely, or even we're seeing, you know, video endpoints are being sent home. They are getting, you know, cheaper uh, and more pervasive. So it, it is a trend that we're seeing. And I think the key pain point and the key um, strategy to optimize for is, it's not gonna go away that some of the participants in these activities will be remote. Um, I agree with James, a lot of our clients are talking about that. How do we get more, you know, more offices where they're closer to where people live and less square footage in these, you know, high, high rise, expensive downtown areas. Um, but wherever these offices are, they're going to need to be video equipped so that you can, or collaboration equipped. When you're there, you're going to need to talk to people who are at home. That's not going away to a certain extent. Uh, and so it's really about that balance of, you know, wherever the square footage is, there's going to need to be video. So how do you make sure that it's designed in a way that the folks that are there in front of that you know, video camera are able to, to talk and collaborate effectively with the folks who are not there? So, and I guess that leans to the next question is, you know, looking at COVID, um, it, it has made a shift in the, the technologies that are being used and how we're gathering data from it but also the real estate. Nick, what's your perspective on that? 
Yeah, I think you know there are some really interesting macroeconomic trends around you know, where where folks are living and um, you know cloud collaboration platforms enabling them to work you know remotely potentially for longer periods of time. Um, so to your point around what is that doing to real estate, it'll be really interesting to see what happens to the real estate in the cities. I, I think to James's point, there are a couple companies that see that as an opportunity um, that having that downtown or more expensive real estate you know potentially the price point come down is an opportunity to grow there but i do think for the most part there is going to be you know somewhat longer term downsizing for the majority of companies there uh, because their employees have learned from this massive work from home experience that it's possible and i will say there, there are now some new studies coming out that you know there's a little bit of burnout and we've maybe um, gone too far with work from home and people are appreciating all the, the you know amenities of the office but i do think you know, that square footage is definitely going to be under scrutiny and because of the technology changes that are of these cloud platforms you can connect wherever there's internet um you know folks are going to be moving around and there's some really interesting macroeconomic trends there that are enabled by a lot of these cloud collaboration platforms Fantastic. So I guess bringing it over to you, James, uh, looking at that, you, you have the ability to move people home or they stay in the office. Are they just going to reconfigure? I mean, I, I work with a lot of folks that do office design mm -hmm. and they're starting to tell me, Dusty, we're, we're no longer building out the cubes, but we're building out the sites that you talked about. So it's, it's a different feel in the office. I mean, what are your you talked a little bit about it but what are you hearing from some of the customers you're working with are the trends now you know it it, it gets interesting one of the, the things that comes up a lot is you know to how do we know what size or how many people occupants do we plan for in a space in an experience-based workplace and the, the answer is that's not an easy uh number to get to it used to be fairly easy to get to when we we're thinking about uh, open offices and you could oversubscribe desks and maybe it's 50% or 70% of, of the occupants for that geographic region is what you would want to plan for. Experience-based workplace ultimately gives your business unit and the occupants, the employees within that business unit, the freedom of choice, the autonomy, if you will, to choose where they do work and how work gets done. That's negative and that it's kind of difficult, very difficult, in fact, to ensure that you have the right available space and amenities at the right time to support the business. But it's also an opportunity to better learn uh, globally across all the silos, how work gets done in the space. Uh, how do you reinforce innovation? How do you have the right team members on the team? So from an HR perspective, from a chief security systems perspective, from an operational perspective, there's certainly a lot of opportunity now to start uh, peeling that onion as it were. And, and getting better at, at learning what that is. The short answer is very difficult to get to. Certainly, I think it'll make more sense if we follow the WX Agile model, where we deploy small, we learn quick, we fail fast, we build on what's good, and we just keep moving forward. Fantastic, thank you for that. Uh, Taylor, how much time do we have left? Are we getting towards the end? We have about five minutes left here, and there are a few questions that came in, so we could take about two, I think. Um, yeah, if you could read James, those. I think this, yeah, I think this one goes for you, James. Um, what sensors are you using to capture the in-room data? So uh, that's actually a little bit of Nick, uh, but my, my first answer would be, uh, it's the existing UC and C gear that you have in the space. Uh, that's what we always recommend that you, you look at your existing systems first to see what information you can derive uh, from it in order to start getting data analytics and then potentially look at adding sensors down the road if that's appropriate. I, I would pass that over to you, Nick. Yeah. Um, to, to add to this, that, that is our approach is to start with what you already have. Uh, it's faster, it's past security. Um, you know, with the video endpoints, you get a lot of rich data from it, but even, you know, there are phones that are pervasive in every conference room. Biopsy can connect to those to get that data too when it's in you know, audio use. So um, those are some of the quote unquote sensors that we use. Uh, and I do think also it's one thing to say, all right, well, you're using what you already have. We don't have any gear in some of these rooms. Um, if you're on the corporate real estate side, I 
highly encourage you to look at some of these newer video endpoints. The price of these video endpoints are dropping pretty drastically. And if you think of the cost of getting boots on the ground to go deploy just purpose-built occupancy sensors, the data is really just as good from the video side. And if you think of obviously the other benefits of that, you know, if folks are going to be remote and they're needing to dial in and you're hearing complaints around not enough video, uh, using the video endpoint as a sensor is actually a great route to go. Uh, also, you'll earn points with your IT you know, counterparts because it's not just another sensor and security route to go, but see what they already have for their video endpoints and look at you know, using some of that occupancy sensor budget, so to speak, over on the IT side uh, with just a different application of it. And, and Nick, I would very quickly add, there's this notion of the physical workplace. So we knew now that it's an experience-based workplace. There's also this notion of the digital workplace. So that's the cloud-based collaboration platforms that you were talking about. For us to be successful, everyone has to have access to that cloud-based collaboration platform. Otherwise, we lose the ability to collaborate across, across our business units. And that's certainly a situation we don't want to be in. So if you have a, an enclosed space or a meeting room, there should be something in that space to allow those occupants to gain easy access to uh, that cloud-based platform. Awesome. Yeah, there's yep. one more question. We have about two minutes left here. Um, this one's pretty broad, but um, any key points that should be included in a work from home HR policy? Um, uh, let me take that first, Nick. My first thought is uh, risk mitigation. There's certainly some policies that you would want to look at from a corporate perspective um, in order to mitigate risk in the health and welfare of workers who are working from home. Um, my, it's always my first thought, and I think I'll just leave it at that. Think of it from a um, liability perspective, how to mitigate risk uh, and make sure that everyone's covered. Uh, Nick? Yeah. Well, Nick, if I could jump in real quick. Um, I had done a, a large, uh, large agreement with uh, ConAgra some time back. And part of their work at home model was the liability. Um, you know, are we giving them the chairs? Are we giving them a desk? Are we could because sitting on a couch and trying to work isn't good for your posture. So there's a lot of things that as an organization that you look to. Uh, will we subsidize subsidize for a desk and a chair? You know, things like that. And if you look at it at the end of the day, it may be cheaper to do some subsidization and help somebody with a home office versus building out a brick and mortar. And then you have the ability to work with them through a collaboration application and monitor and see how they're doing. Nick, I jumped in on you there. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. Just to, to round it out, I think you know folks like James have really that expertise in crafting the HR component of it. So where I'll take it in a slightly different direction is the IT component and the enablement component of a work from home policy. We have to make sure that your IT teams have the visibility into troubleshooting those calls from home or in the office and that your employees have the tools necessary to collaborate from home and that it's seamless when they come into the office as well because we want to promote that for all the culture benefits and um, you know, all the collaboration benefits from coming in the, the office as well. So it's a little bit more of an IT point of view on that work from home policy, but both you know, enabling the end users is important as well as enabling your IT teams to support them when they are working. So everyone, thank you for your time. Nick, thank you. James, thank you so much for what you shared with us today. To those of you who attended today, we appreciate your time. Uh, we know time is precious. And if there are questions that you have, Nick, if you could throw up that slide with uh, the phone numbers on it, but um, if you have that, uh, <laughs> but you can always reach out to me, Dusty Stanford. I have the ability to reach out to James and to Nick, and we can schedule time to spend more time with you over questions that you have. We're happy to open our kimonos and show you the solutions, both from Cognitive and from Viapta, and help you get through what a lot of companies are going through right now. We've got at-home workers, we've got new technologies or added on technologies, and we have real estate that we're trying to decide how do we best meet the needs 
of our internal employees and our external employees. With that shared, folks, again, we want to thank you so much for your time, and uh, hopefully we'll be speaking soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.